Hey everyone, AJ Giuliani here, and I just wanted to talk about one of the biggest topics that we are seeing over and over again when we're working with teachers around the country, when we're talking with them online, when we're leading workshops, when we're sharing resources, and the conversation centers around this issue with student apathy. And I think, to me, it's something that has really, really impacted and affected educators from all around the country, probably all around the world as well as we come out of COVID and then come out of the pandemic type of learning that was happening. I hear teachers say all the time, you know, I've never had students be more apathetic. I've never had more apathy and lack of caring and not finishing work or even starting the work. Just not caring about the fact that they got a bad grade or any of these types of things. I've never had to deal with this on such a high level on such a broad spectrum of students. And we see this, whether it's in elementary school, middle school, high school, we see this with all different ages. We're even hearing some college university professors talk about it as well. Student apathy seems to be one of the really big problems we have right now in education. And I think it's there for a lot of different reasons, right? I shared a blog post recently, engagement has been dropping for years. We, we saw this blog, Dangerously Irrelevant, posted some just statistics from a big survey. A million students were surveyed in 2019, 2018, before the pandemic. What we saw was each year kids were in school, they become less and less and less engaged. And I think by the time they were in 10th grade, there's only about 30% of students that would say they were engaged for part of the time, right? Even just some of the time in school. And that engagement levels were higher at the elementary and it just kept on dropping each year. And some of the other things that dropped were kids weren't having fun in school, they weren't getting to work on things that were interesting to them, uh, just those different types of things. That has been kind of the case for a while. When I was teaching, a lot of times I didn't know who those disengaged students were because they were compliant. They were going through the game of school, they were following the motions and they may or may not have been paying attention. They could have just been going through and trying to get whatever grade they needed to get to keep their parents happy or keep them from failing out or whatever that looked like. But they weren't engaged, they were just compliant. When COVID happened and a lot of us went to virtual and remote and then hybrid learning, a lot of our, our students saw that they didn't have to put on their Zoom cameras and engage. They didn't have to have conversations. They didn't have to do the schoolwork. They didn't have to fake it anymore that they were just complying and going through the motions. It was kind of accepted that whatever we needed to do to get through, we're gonna get through. And there was all kinds of situations that were impacting students during those, those years, those months of kind of doing that type of learning. Now we've come out of that. The thing that I see all the time is that a lot of students are kind of saying, I'm still not engaged in school. It's still not interesting to me, or I don't connect to it or find it relevant. And I don't really need to play that game anymore. You know, I'm just gonna, gonna coast on by and be apathetic. I think that's what we're seeing from a lot of different teachers. A couple of the big things here is that most of the curriculum that we see was not created to engage students. Think about the programs that you may be using, the curriculum uh, that you have. Most curriculum was created to, number one, cover material, get through the content, and cover and hit those standards. And ultimately, to prepare kids to do well on a standardized multiple choice type of assessment. None of that is connecting to engagement. And so a lot of times these programs and curriculums that were created before the pandemic or after just weren't created with apathy in mind. They were created with the idea that if you gave students something to do in school and you told them that there was a grade associated to it, that they would do the work, that they would go through that process. And sure, plenty of them have bells and whistles and tech stuff and this type of thing, but we've seen the majority of, of the curriculum out there. When I talk with teachers and say, well, what does your curriculum look like? You know, it's dry, it's not alive, it's not organic, and it's just meant to, to cover the material and, and get through those standards. There's all different types of 
other factors. We have students who, if they're older, probably fourth, fifth grade and beyond for some of the kids, they have devices in their hands that they can look up whatever they want to. It's a quick, consistent, they're not spending more than four, five, 10 seconds on anything, whether it's messaging friends or watching a short video clip and scrolling through Instagram or TikTok or whatever that may be. It's all quick attention bursts of things that are interesting, things that are curious. If they want to look something up, they do it quickly, right? We used to call this kind of the Netflix generation. I remember talking with folks like Thomas Murray and calling it the Netflix generation, but it's beyond that now. It's way beyond that. Most of our kids live in an environment where they're watching videos like this or listen to audios like this and it jump cuts every couple of seconds to keep their attention. There's words on the screen, all kinds of things to grab their attention. And so when they come to school and they have to sit in a desk or a row or whatever it looks like, then they have to listen to someone talk or watch a PowerPoint or any of those types of things, it's the least interesting thing out there. You take some of those other kids, the younger kids, who are consistently watching YouTube, maybe playing video games, those different types of things, it's a, such a difference from what they're doing in their lives outside of school to then what learning and interacting looks like inside of school. We've seen that over and over again throughout the years, but right now, everything that they're just interacting with has a lower and lower time span, right? You think about 50s, 60s, and they're moving from radio to TV, but in TV, you know, at least they're watching something for 30 minutes, an hour, or something like that, and we, we kind of move to Netflix and that type of thing. It still was a little bit long form. Now, everything is very short form content. Sometimes this apathy can just come from, they don't have just mental stamina to stay with a topic for that long or stay with learning for something for that long. That muscle has to be built and groomed over time. And a lot of times we, you know, we struggle with that. And you also see students that have all different types of life experiences, trauma, different life experiences, things that are impacting them, plenty of things that we just don't know about. And so if you add all that up together, we see that there's a lot of reasons for students to be apathetic. I think the first step in dealing with this big problem of student apathy is trying to be as empathetic as possible. I have five kids, four are school age, and I see each of them go through different levels of this apathy. All four of my kids deal with it differently, deal with different teachers differently, school, what they're doing. Even though they, they want to uh, do it, they still have times where they are apathetic in terms of what they're learning. And so I have to be empathetic as a dad, even though I don't maybe necessarily agree with sometimes their attitude, but I have to think, where is this coming from? Putting that hat on first, putting those shoes on first and being just empathetic with our students of what their daily life looks like, what their interactions look like with technology and information and learning and communication, what their experiences look like, to be honest, right? What their life experiences look like. If we take that and then say, okay, now I kind of understand where they're coming from, then we can focus on some of the solutions because we can't really come up with ideas for the solutions unless we are really understanding where they're coming from. And I think there's three specific ways to combat the student apathy that we're seeing right now. If you're a teacher or an educator or someone who works with students or even adult um, learners, you've always had people that are teaching, that you're educating, that have been apathetic throughout the years. This isn't a new thing. It's maybe grown and become a bigger thing, but it but definitely isn't a new thing, right, in terms of that process. Here's three specific things, and I'm, I'm gonna break down some, some reasons inside those things. Three specific ways that I think we can um, help get out of that. The first one is just a real focus on conversation and relationships. And what I mean by that is a lot of times we have students that are apathetic because they don't have a connection to the person and the folk that is kind of behind this, right? And so this is just us as educators saying, you know what? We know what all the research says. When kids make a connection with their teacher, when mentees make a connection with their mentor, the learning achievement goes up. We've seen that. You can look at any different type of research out there. And so I always suggest two specific ways that I think are, are really easy to develop some better and stronger relationships 
with your students, specifically the ones that are showing that they're just kind of apathetic about the whole school thing and, and the classwork. The number one is the two by 10 uh, method that Angela Watson and other folks have really kind of championed over the years. And that's just for 10 straight days, having a short two minute conversation with that student about something other than school. I've seen this happen with my own son who is in fifth grade and struggles sometimes. One of his learning support teachers, after one week he came up and went, Mr. Mr. Howard is always talking and asking about my basketball, my lacrosse, and he really is interested. He coaches basketball. And I thought to myself, what a powerful way to develop a relationship because now my son sees interactions with that teacher as more than just, it's about school. It's about, about life, it's about anything. And so they can talk and share. And then when it's time to get to work, there's this trust build up. There's this relationship build up. And so that two by 10 method is simple. And you specifically can, can focus and do that with your students that are really struggling with the apathy piece. Then the other one is conferencing. And here's what I mean by that a lot of times students receive feedback from us and a lot of times and it's it's written on a piece of paper or it's on a test or an assignment or it's in a grade book or something like that and so I would argue that one of the best things that I ever did and I did it much later in my teaching career I wish that I learned about it in my first year of teaching is instead of giving so much written feedback, I would have short conferences with students. And it's really tough to do this if you're teaching a traditional method of just kind of going through a textbook and giving tests and that type of stuff, but it's not hard to do it when students have work time for something or if they're going through stations or centers, then it becomes really easy. Having conferences and bringing student work and saying, hey, these are some of the things that I saw I really have high expectations for you. And here's some of the ways I think you can improve on it. What do you think you could do better? And having those conversations back and forth. And so you're having conferences and talking about the learning instead of them seeing as a transactional thing where they turn something in and they get a feedback that maybe they look at, maybe they don't look at, and they move on to the next thing. If students feel like the learning is just going through the process and that they don't have to worry about that, that test or that assignment or the activity because they'll be on to something else and there won't even be a conversation around it, then yeah, of course, you know, you can see apathy creeping in over and over again. So that would be number one. It's just refocusing. A lot of times in the beginning of the year, we focus on those types of things, refocusing on, especially the students that are apathetic, having those conversations, building those relationships. Number two, I would think is probably, you know, the most important one that I see right now, and that is trying to find ways to make the learning meaningful and relevant. And I say those two things because this is by far what students say is some of the reasons for their apathy is that it's not relevant when I'm learning and it's not meaningful. They're not interested in it. And it doesn't have to be something that they have to be curious about. It doesn't have to be something that they're passionate about. Those things aren't gonna happen in every, you know, thing that we're teaching in school. And we have standards to cover and all these types of things. So I think that's somewhat impossible. However, the words meaningful and relevant are really important here. Because if we look at our existing curriculum. And we know in a lot of circumstances, we can't change that. It's our curriculum we got to cover. The question is, how can we look at each task, each unit, each thing that we're having to teach and assess and have students learn? How can we look at that through a lens of how can I make this meaningful and relevant for my students? And also a lens of how can I teach this and have them still love and enjoy learning and the process. And so I think that's a big piece. And for me, I always come back to, well, if you do more project-based learning, you can make it meaningful and relevant with what the students are working on, what they're creating, what problems that they're solving. If you do inquiry-based learning, you can make it more meaningful and relevant because it's connecting to things that they're interested and curious about. And of course, if you do more community-based and authentic types of learning experiences, students are going to just be able to connect 
to what they are learning more. Now, anytime I, I talk with this, it's better to kind of have examples. This is one of the big things we do in workshops is we'll talk with teachers specifically about their grade level, content area, subject, whatever they're working on, and try to find some ways through a design sprint to kind of figure out how it can be more authentic, how it can be more meaningful and relevant, how we can connect what they're doing to the community and do some kind of work around that. The big thing that people talk about all the time is this takes a lot of time, and it, it can take a lot of time, right? There's for sure the six to eight week project-based experiences that you can do. I'm not necessarily a fan of starting with that. I actually really think that starting with sprints, two, three days, four days tops of students working around some type of problem or inquiry or design and solving something or creating something, it's not gonna come out perfect at the end. It may not be aesthetically pleasing, but the students are gonna work through something that is relevant and meaningful in that kind of sprint-based way. I love that idea. I think there's a lot of research to support sprints, but you know, that, that second thing, right? If, if number one is relationships, number two is meaningful and relevant. I think that's so important. Number three, and one that we all can look into and kind of say, what can I do about this? If you think about a curriculum, it's kind of like a architectural blueprint. And so you have to stay with the confines of that blueprint, right? You have to build the house or the building or whatever you're doing with the actual blueprint. When you look at instructional strategies, that is the design of the house, right? That's the interior, that's the, the outside landscape. And that's all those things where you could take the same blueprint. You've gone down a street and seen the same model of house one by one by one by one. And then you've noticed, depending on how people design that house, the colors they use, the landscaping, the interior, all that kind of stuff, it can go from a wide difference of what that looks like. And the same thing goes with what I think the number three way here, and that's instructional strategies. So if one is relationship, two is authentic and meaningful uh, learning, three would be instructional strategy, which is how do we plan, structure, and ultimately deliver that educational experience for our students. Is it 80, 90% teacher talk and only 10, 20% student talk? How can we flip that? How can we have more students talking, doing things like the discussion games or Socratic seminars or uh, working in groups and collaborating? How can we do more of that? Because we know when kids do the talking, they're going to be less apathetic. They're going to be more invested. When we think about direct instruction versus active learning, we know a lot of times students feel like they're learning more through direct instruction because they've had that lecture-based approach, but we, we know that when they actually go through active learning, they learn a whole lot more, even if they don't like it as much at first, right? Because they're having to do all of the work. Think about a blended approach where they're getting short-term kind of interactions with you as the teacher, they're doing something online, they're doing something in a small group, they're reading. This idea that all of the information doesn't have to come from you as the teacher because there's a plethora of experts out there online that are explaining things, learning, and kids can kind of interact with it that way and so many technology tools. I love uh, what John Kerper and folks have done with Edu Protocols, where kids are going through and learning through different types of lesson and instructional frames that they're ultimately engaging with and they don't have a chance really to have some apathy with because they're going through this kind of fast-paced learning. These instructional strategies is difficult, I think, sometimes because we have to change and manage how we do things as an educator and yet they can be often the most impactful way to move kids from a state of apathy, boredom, not caring, to really connecting and engaging with the content and material that we have to teach them. So these three ways are not the only three ways. I think there's probably a ton of other ways. I would love for you, if you're watching this YouTube video, if you're reading an article, maybe you're listening to the podcast, I would love for you to engage in the comments over at ajgiuliani.com and have a conversation about what this looks like. How do we combat this problem with student apathy? What are some ways that you've done it that have worked? We all learn from each other and we share things that work. We all become better educators and facilitators. Thanks for everything you do. And here's to you combating that student apathy that we're seeing across the board.